next one is an amazing video I was sent about a guy called Matt Callanan. An amazing and inspiring soul who goes by the name of Matt Callanan. So Matt, prior, welcome to We Make Success Happen podcast. Thank you very much, Matthew. Nice, easy question to start with. Sounds like an interview already. <laughs> <laughs> Are you happy? Yes. Yes is the, is the main thing, knowing that nothing is perfect. There's pros and cons to everything. And I'm very much a work in progress. But yeah, ultimately, um, I am happy. Could I be happier? Yes. Is there's a lot of other things that I want to do? Yes. But I think it's important that pretty much every day when you wake up, if you're not saying yes, then you need to do something to change that because otherwise you can have a bit of a miserable life. And I think a lot of people do have a miserable life because they're not willing to change. What would you say then to those people that you think aren't open to change? Well, just before we say that, am I allowed to ask you questions? Can do if you want, but this is more about you, really. <laughs> <laughs> okay, go on. What, what was the question, sorry? Well, what would you say to those sort of people that may be stuck in a rut? And I'd say that the biggest thing that I'm realising is, and there's a few people out there that are, are, that are bashing this drum, as it were, is that it's all down to self-awareness and being honest with yourself. And I think a lot of people try and distract themselves from reality or do everything possibly to not actually confront what they know they need to confront. Uh, if you look in a mirror and you look at yourself and you say, am I really happy? And you look straight into your own eyes and you can't say yes. I just don't understand how you can go on with your life like that. I don't understand how you can then go to work the next day and just pretend that everything's fine and then just come home and watch TV all night and then do it again and again and again and again and just hang around similar people who sort of, they all confirm to each other that it's all fine when actually all of them know it isn't fine but no one's got the balls to do anything about it because when you do start putting yourself out there or, uh, or sort of challenging the status quo, I think obviously then people challenge you and you, I think people need to be a bit braver and say, yeah, I am going to do something big, different and it's not what everyone else is doing. And I'm happy with it. And if you don't like it, that's your problem. This is my life and I'm doing something about it. And I think it's, I guess it's down to fear, but I think ultimately it's down to being honest with yourself. I think people struggle with that. Or if they are aware of it, they'll do everything in their power not to do something about it because it's scary. So for the one or two listeners that we currently have <laughs> on the We Make Success Happen podcast. <laughs> Who's the other one? Your wife? <laughs> and you, you, can't, you can't count Albie either. <laughs> you can't Damn. force it on a child. What's your, to give a kind of quick life summary of where you've kind of started from yeah. uh, to where you are now? Very quickly, I guess, quite a random upbringing in terms of I was born in southwest of England in the Cotswolds. Then we moved to London, then we moved to Bournemouth, and then we basically zigzagged all the way up the UK, moving every two years because my dad kept getting made redundant because he worked in the manufacturing sector. With that came its own problems in terms of you always the new kid, there was a lot of bullying, there was a lot of instability. But ultimately, I had a pretty normal upbringing. We lived in a caravan at one point. That was fun. And yeah, I think there was a big... I guess I guess the big thing to do would be to highlight the big turning points then. So I guess a big thing for me was um, I was massively sporty as a kid. Like I just loved sport. That's all I ever lived for, just sport. Any any type of sport or games, like I loved it. Mm. And then when I hit 12, I was noticing that my mum and dad were working very long hours. We didn't see them much. And they weren't the happiest people at all. And my dad at some one point was like doing two and a half hours commute each day, each way. And I was just like, I am not ending up like this. And I mean, it sounds a bit weird for a 12 year old to think about this, but, but I did. And it was just a fact of life. I was observant. And then I just wrote down everything that I loved from life, everything that I thought I wanted from life and, ev and everything I wanted from a job. And then went on a bit of a mission to find out what that job might be so that I can not end up like my mum and dad effectively. And that, 
to cut a long story short, ended up being, I wanted to be a fighter pilot in the Air Force. I was just like, okay, this is now the new aim in life and you're going to do everything possible to make this happen. Even though it was a pretty ambitious target with background and zero connections and didn't go to the greatest schools, blah, 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 blah. But I don't know, from that day on, I was very, very focused. And then I think that just taught me a lot about determination and resilience and all sorts of things on the road to get there. And then did university, all that sort of thing. So so I applied to the Air Force when I was 17. And, I, and because I was so fixated, and this wasn't arrogance, it was naivety, I think. I hadn't even considered what would happen if I didn't get in. I was I was that driven. I hadn't even considered it. And sometimes when you're doing these things, sometimes that is good not to even consider failure because you need that driver. And I didn't get in. And then that made me go off to Africa on a bit of a reset stroke learn a bit more about yourself, do some other cool stuff around the world and hopefully you'll bounce off the walls and learn stuff. And I did, went to university, eventually got a scholarship with the Air Force, joined the Air Force. Yeah, I'll give you a quick rundown on the Air Force. Did some flying training, did some cool survival stuff, worked with some of the best people I'll ever meet and work with in the world. One of them was Prince William, randomly. That's cool. Yeah, that was a, that was a bit of a shock to the system. It was like, guys, you need to turn up at a briefing at seven o'clock before met brief or something like okay you guys are doing operation golden kestrel and when it all happened i was just thinking did they actually call it golden yeah kestrel? yeah that was the name of him and um well that's what he was called <laughs> well we didn't say <laughs> all right golden kestrel <laughs> in fact i think we did actually <laughs> just for a laugh but um but to me it was it was like we'd been summoned for this world war Two top secret sort of you guys are going to fly this secret plane to do this and this and this. You're going to do something never has been done before. But unfortunately, it wasn't quite that. It was like, yeah, you, you guys have been selected randomly and obviously heavily vetted security-wise. And this person's going to be a member of your course and they're very hush-hush about it. Anyway, and um, yeah, um, we did elementary flying training with Prince William and it was a brilliant, brilliant experience. Like, loved it. And then speed things up. I was down in the Falkland Islands about um, five years in and we just got an email s saying you guys need to return to the base. You need to turn up at this day at this time for yet another briefing. And the briefing was, we don't really know how to say this, but we lost your jobs. Wow. We were just like, uh, what? Bearing in mind, I'd signed on the dotted line for 18 years. And, um, and what year was this? Kind of like how many uh, years in was this? About five years in. And so it was a bit of a shock to the system. But at the same time, like I did like the military and lots of things, but as with anything, there's pros and cons, perceptions and realities. And I sort of actually saw this as an opportunity for a reset again, because as you get older, things change. And I'd learned that I didn't just want to do one thing in my life. And I was realizing this was becoming one thing in my life and I wanted more variety. So, this is where, at the time, I was helping my mates organise going around the world in a London taxi for world records and blah de blah de blah and, and I was getting more and more envious as the start line was coming up and I was like, this is going to be such an epic trip. I'm gutted. I can't come on it. And you can see where this is going. And I just thought, that is what I need to do with my... Well, <laughs> after being made redundant, I need to get in a taxi <laughs> and go around the world. <laughs> it's um, an obvious decision, isn't it? Well, it's natural. It. Yeah, it's an obvious, <laughs> natural, sensible, very well thought out decision. No, but honestly, I mean, I'd done enough adventures to this stage, which I realised, which I see as not just going to do a cool experience, but the learning in such a short amount of time is unbelievable and it's fun and it's different and it teaches new things about yourself and you're always learning new skills i've just got a massive passion for adventure and it's helped me previously like when i didn't get in the air force and things like that it really shifts your pr perspective it gives you a reset it, it opens your eyes to what else is out in the world and what other possibilities are there and that's why i just thought this is gold like i need to do this again and it'll help me reset it'll help me think it'll help me talk to others and drink a few beers and explore new ideas and hopefully i can come up with a good plan of what you're going to do next so went and did that ended up again i considered being a monk trying to go for a big high flying city job setting up my own business did you actually consider being a monk yeah a hundred percent. Really? A hundred percent serious. Special forces, all sorts of different things. Hang on, why? 
Let's go back to the monk. <laughs> <laughs> go on. <laughs> what What was it about being a monk that attracted you then? What was um, the main thing is the money. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> the main thing I was like, I need to be loaded. How can I do this, <laughs> a monk? No, I mean. All, of all these travels, I'd, I've sort of come across a lot of monks and I've always been very intrigued by them and how they live and how calm they are and the inner peace that they seem to have. And I've always been fascinated by it. I've never really done any research, not too much research on it, but I, it was always part of me. It's like, especially in the Air Force, I just thought if this all goes tits up, you know, I might just go and be a monk. And they always used to laugh at me. And I was like, I'm dead serious. Because if you think about it, it does require the same sort of discipline and sacrifice to be a, like a fighter pilot or something. And so I just thought, okay, so I know I've got strong enough discipline to be able to do that. And I've also learned that there's so much crap in life, materialistic junk and busy and all this stuff that people say is important and vital and stuff. But so I've realized that none of that is important and monks don't have hardly anything. They just live a very simple peaceful life mm. that's disciplined and so i thought why not give it a go at this because i don't know if you've ever met like a proper monk there's a lot of these fake dodgy ones but <laughs> fake <you're> dodgy <laughs> monks <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> but especially around where hong are you hanging about so well hong kong is <laughs> is one for them that's for sure and so anyway when you actually meet a genuine one and you shake their hand and you look in their eyes it's like this access to a whole new world like the energy you feel in their presence and their eyes and their calmness is unlike anything i've ever seen in any people before ever and i love mountains and i love fresh air and i love nature so i just had this sort of dream of living in this really high level himalayan monastery with all these monks just thinking this is this is the height of life like that may, maybe that would make me really happy when you say that, that's the polar opposite, though, from <laughs> the kind of military. <laughs> totally, to totally. But this is who I am as a person. A this is who I am as a person. I'm, I'm, I'm I can be quite adaptable, um, and I, and I like to do different things. I just like to do different things. Uh, definitely extremes of things, and I guess it's all just down to curiosity and fascination. It's like, oh, that looks interesting. I'll, I really want to go and give that a go. So, the monk application was rejected <laughs> yeah they turned me down <laughs> <laughs> they're like what, you need to work next? on your cv <laughs> uh, so ultimately after talking to somebody who deals with oxford and cambridge graduates her name is katie and we came to meet years later this was just a phone call who i'd been put onto via a friend of a friend and we had a big chat about everything and i said look ultimately i want to have a go at all this stuff and it, to me, it seems a bit impossible. I can't do everything. I understand that. But I, but I want to try it all. And she came up with the plan. She was just like, well, why don't you continue being an airline pilot so that on paper, you are a professional pilot on paper. And to anyone asks, that's what you are. Mm. But at the same time, because of the time off it gives you, you can experiment with all this other stuff. And as you've already learned, what you might think might be a cool thing to do, you don't ever know until you actually do it yourself. And I was like, this is brilliant. That's what I'm going to do. And so that's how I ended up in Hong Kong. And here we are today, experimenting still. So you're a, a full-time pilot. Yeah. And you run these adventure academies, the Matt Pryor Adventure Academy on the side. Yeah. And you've got a few other things in the pipeline as well. Yeah. What's the, the premise behind the Adventure Academy then? One of my things from after I got made redundant was I've always been fascinated with not business in general because I always saw it as suits and money and none of that ever interested me in paperwork, the polar opposite to what I'm interested in. But A, I was always intrigued how Richard Branson loved business so much and he loves adventure. So I was like, well, if he likes it, there's got to be something maybe interesting about it. And then um, I always wanted to have my own business. So that was always in the back of my head. Mm. But I was never going to go for something just because of money. It had to be a passion because I knew it's probably going to be hard to do. You know the statistics on new businesses. And just to dedicate my time to something, it had to be something that I loved. Like I, 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 That was really important to me. And I didn't really have any idea what that might be, um, but it was always in the back of my head. And then we effectively, so we went on holiday basically, me and my, my missus, Leah, and uh, we always go to random places, genuinely off the beaten track. I know you hear that term all the time, but we do. And in this case, it was a few photographs we found online and there was very little other information. Mm. And 
as you know with all these things, sometimes it goes very well and sometimes it goes tits up and you're just like, what a waste of a week that was. But at least you know, you've got to explore these things. <laughs> yeah. So we did and uh, we had an amazing trip and um, Leah said to me at the start, she said, look, can we do a bit more of what you do on your sort of adventures, just like a mini version of it? And I was like, it was really nice for A, for her to hear that and and B, for me to think about it a little bit more and just say, okay, so how am I going to condense all that into one week that's quite hard to do mm. uh, anyway we gave it a crack and yeah there's high points low points and some stuff's a bit hard and sh she was loving it she, she had a big smile on her face and we were just going on the plane back and i said do you know what if i could build and design a whole adventure training area bearing in mind I had the military stuff in the background i'm very used to training and training areas and how to get the most out of people and how to do that that uh, that where we've just been that's what i would build and she was like so you don't need to build it it, it exists and then i said uh, go on and then she said why don't you and i was like why don't you what and then all these ideas came to my head i was like okay maybe i could turn it into this if i did it seven days door to door that could appeal to people because there's a lot of people out there that are um, time poor and money rich or or whatever that i could target um and that's the common excuse isn't it i don't have time i don't have time i don't have time you hear it all the f it's all to do with priorities everyone has time it just depends how you prioritize it um and then you hear all the excuses that you've heard from other people about why they haven't gone on adventures like i'm I'm not too sure about these things i wouldn't know where to start you're gonna get kidnapped um how do you raise the money sponsorship all these questions and then and i just thought why don't you piece all this stuff together and try and create a solution and that's what i did yeah, you've been on it, Matt. So what yeah, do you think? Yeah, so I went on the Adventure Academy because this this is how we randomly met. You were looking for someone to make a promo video for you. Mm -hmm. and somehow you found me on the uh, the interwebs. So, yes, I actually went on, was it the, the first one or one of the trial versions of um, it? Yeah, so it was our quite plan early was, on. yeah, so w once I made that decision that I was going to give it a go, which was sort of end of August, I realised the season is October. So I was like, if you're going to give it a go, you need to get it done quickly. You need to pull all this together and get it happening, reality. Um, and so this was all part of the, not only do I want to trial it, I also realized how are you going to advertise this? How are you going to capture people's, people's imagination? Well, you're going to only do it with a video because people, again, are so bloody busy nowadays. You've only got a couple of seconds to get, to capture that. So you need to do it with a video, like video is key. And so I've realized after filming my own adventures and stuff like that, that and just life in general, you know your own strengths, you know your own weaknesses, you can't do everything. So to achieve the best outcome, you're much better getting professionals or the best of the best in their own businesses and bringing them all together on a project because that will achieve the best outcome rather than trying to do it all yourself and just doing okay okay is not good enough i mean it was an amazing experience for me and i think some of my friends and family are sick of me talking about <laughs> it <laughs> rabbiting on about <laughs> volcanoes and white t-shirts but it, i mean it was a great experience i mean i probably wouldn't have done it like i did and i wouldn't recommend it i mean i came straight from mexico flew the wrong way around the world and then pretty much flew over to indonesia from mexico uh, with several flights in between, so my <laughs> and, the, and the other thing was, Matt, we were trying to do something very ambitious. Yeah, it was the trial, so there was stuff that was going to go wrong, and I've never done professional filming before, so I didn't really realise how long that would add extra to every single day as well. And you and me did um, a bit extra to the normal trip as well. So it's like a longer trip, a harder trip. We were both jet lagged because I just landed from Rome as well and came straight down from Hong Kong. And we just went for it. And I think it was mainly adrenaline that kept us going. <laughs> I mean, it was amazing fun. I mean, we arrived and the next day we went up this massive volcano. I was, we I'd never been up a volcano before. We literally landed off the first plane, didn't we? Met in the airport and got straight on the next one. Yeah, that's it. Yeah, just about made it. And walked out this volcano. I had a massive rucksack, carried way, way too much. I had a white T-shirt on. I mean, I looked like a complete amateur. <laughs> and your little Vietnamese hat. And a little Vietnamese <laughs> hat that I'd borrowed from someone. 
I gotta be honest, when I saw you, I was like, this is gonna be a very interesting week. <laughs> <laughs> but I got, I, I mean, I got to the top. I mean, it took a little bit longer than it should have done. The but, best um, thing was, Matt, your attitude. Because you've got such a positive attitude and your energy, I was just like, we will achieve this. Even if it's a struggle, even if it's a hard, I was like, he's got the best attitude and that's what it's all about. If I was doing it again, I mean, I, ha- I think I had two cameras on me a tripod, um, I had a stabilising system, I had the drone as well that I was carrying, plus all the other stuff that everyone else was sort of carrying, like clothes and Yeah, yeah. and we had all that film and gear. Everything. That yeah. film gear did make a big difference. Like It's a lot of gear to yeah. take. Yeah, but I mean, that's something that I kept in my head. I just thought I had that vision of getting to the top yeah. and just thinking of the amazing footage and the personal... Achievement. Achievement of, of getting up there. And it's por- and it's important that these things are hard so that you do value that achievement uh, and you do push yourself because otherwise you don't get that real sense of what you're just about to explain when you did get to the top. Yeah, because I think if it was too easy, there's there's no real success attached to it. No, it because needs to be a struggle. Yeah, and it's something, you're doing something that not everyone has done. No, and without divulging too much, the way in which we do stuff is not how all the other tourists do it. Yeah, so do you want to describe what sort of happens on this when people go away with you? What what happens and what do, what do you want them to come away with? Um, to have I'm learnt? not going to describe too much about what happens because I deliberately keep it vague because I think one of the key points of all of this in not just adventure but life is learning how to deal with the unknown and... The only way you can do that is by putting people into those situations where they don't know what's going to happen. And I think what I want them to ultimately achieve by the end of it or feel or experience is an appreciation of what they are capable of as people. And that is my aim. Now, people are all different and I I only take small groups because I like sort of if you've got small groups you can achieve an awful lot the value there for those individuals is much higher than if you've got some Chinese tour group with a bloody flag and 50 people behind you You, I mean you're going to do well to remember 50 names let alone make any other connections with them (laughs) Um, and so that and hold an umbrella as well (laughs) well yeah I mean mean, multitasking we're men simple (laughs) so ultimately that that is that is what I want to achieve I want to show I don't think that people realise what they are ultimately capable of including myself unless someone else does push them a little bit further than they push themselves hence why people have coaches and trainers and advisors and all that sort of stuff because the top people in the world realize that you will only push yourself so far you you can get more out of yourself but you have to accept that sometimes that's going to come from other people now, there's a lot of people out there with egos and stuff that are like, nah, that's a load of bollocks. Like, I just do it all myself. It's like, fine, okay. But it's proven that you can push that even further. So I guess that's ultimately what I do. And do you think they can then apply that to their own kind of personal life and their business life? And Massively, massively. And and what's interesting is because I, what on what's online and what I allow to be released about the Adventure Academy and even in all the media and everything, it's all very vague. Um, it's attracted all sorts of different people for all sorts of different reasons. And I love it because of that. And a lot of them are personal reasons and nothing to do with adventure, but they realize the benefits of an adventure and what that can give to their life. And that that's what I see happen sort of thing. So sometimes it's like relationship things sometimes it's they've gone through hard times generally it's just perspective uh, genuinely getting away from their normal life i.e the other side of the world you cut off from communications you're massively back to basics you're in touch with nature generally you're with three other strangers that don't know don't know anything about you at all you're like a white blank page and off we go and everyone's on the same page in terms of what they want to achieve by it. They, they've got a good me- positive mental attitude. They don't really know what's going to happen. They've all just turned up on the other side of the world to meet me, a stranger, and some other strangers, and they're up for it. And the shifts that happen are quite amazing to witness in one week. And I'm not just saying that. Like That's why I've done video testimonials now, because that's the only way that people are going to believe me. 
and I'm more than happy to put people in touch with other people that have been on it so that I'm that confident that it does have a positive effect. Varying, fair enough, but um, yeah. What sort of shifts do you see in people then? I think self-confidence is a big one. I think a lot of people, um, like I say, they don't realise what they're capable of. And when they sort of do what they do and realise that they did that themselves, they go home, you can tell they get on that plane with like a spring in their step with a greater feeling of, I can do way more than I think I can do. And you'll only ever get that if you actually experience it. You're never going to get it by watching other people and reading about it and, and whatever. Like you have to have that personal experience so that you have that mental reference in your head that I know what I'm capable of. Um, what was the question again? <laughs> <laughs> what's the what's the shifts that you oh, the see? Shifts, the shifts, yeah, the, yeah, yeah. Sh- the shifts okay. that you see in people. Um, the other thing is perspective and the other thing is um, awareness. So even just the talking between the different people they're generally totally different people from all different walks of life different backgrounds and stuff like that and different ages and they learn an awful lot from each other's lives and and what they've all been through and we've all been through it whether it whether you advertise it or not but people go through hard times and I think sometimes people think oh I'm the only person that's going through this no one will understand me and it's just like because we do, you do go on to that level quite quickly with people on these adventures because you're not distracted by technology and TV and all this sort of stuff. It's candles and mountain time, basically. So you actually have to sit down and have face-to-face conversations, which is a novelty for people nowadays. <laughs> but I also think because we, are, we don't know each other that well and we are blank pages, people are, are strangely very happy to go quite deep and be quite open quite quickly. And it gets pretty emotional sometimes. It's almost like a little counseling session it it really does and people really open up and I think I can see it that some people they haven't opened up for years and years and years like tens of years 20 years either because they don't want to or they've never felt comfortable or they don't have anyone else to talk about it um, and so all that sort of stuff's all, all come out I've had like lots of tears and lots of um, like little epiphanies and lots of shifts in people's lives and and, and lots of genuine learning and the cool thing is I keep in touch with everyone now. Like I give everyone my WhatsApp and I'm talking to them regularly. Like I spoke to four of them this last week. So it's an ongoing relationship because I genuinely am interested in their, in their lives and their people and their friends now. And um, I, I quite like that about it. And we're obviously comfortable on a level to keep helping each other all the way through. So it's just expanding a really nice group of friends for me as well. Why do you think people open up so much then? I mean, like I said, I don't know if previously past in past in my past, especially sometimes I've mentioned my deepest and darkest secrets to a complete stranger because I want an objective opinion. And I think sometimes when you ask people who are friends and family, they're connected to you, they know you, and that may not give you the objective of feeling uh, opinion that you're looking for because it will be connected with love or protectiveness or uh, or whatever and so I think that I don't know the science behind this this is just all observation I think people quite like it and I think people like that they feel the bond between us is so strong that we can discuss things that they know is probably never going to go anywhere but at the same time they can discuss it they can open their heart to it um, and I, th- I just think that, I don't know, they just feel that they're in a safe enough place to do that. Is there anyone on the adventures that you've done so far, is there anyone that you've pushed too far or the kind of experience has pushed too far? Or has everyone kind of come up against the challenges of climbing up that volcano or whatever and struggling but got have, have overcome it? I mean, define push too far. No one's died. Well, anyone kind of completely given up and just said, I can't take this. Because when we went up the volcano, yeah. there was that one guy who was quite mouthy and said, oh, I've kind of done this, I've done this. And he gave up after about a mile in and we yeah. hadn't even got to the volcano. Yeah, I mean, you couldn't... Uh, and this was like someone else that we met on the mountain, nothing to do with us, yeah? Yeah, exactly, yeah. And um, I, I've got so used to seeing that sort of stuff from a mile off, especially in the Air Force where there's so many egos. Um, And it's generally those sorts of people that are trying to make up for actual insecurities. So they put on this big bravado on the outside. Um, 
and so yeah i can see them from a mile off and they're normally the people that, that they don't have the grit and the determination and the stuff that's required to succeed in these sorts of things and it's all and it's also normally like it's that phrase it's the quiet ones so you might have a little bit of an introvert who might not be outwardly confident or whatever but you put them in these situations and they've they've got the grit and the determination and and the correct attitude to get through it's just they don't shout about it and sometimes they don't even know they've got it within them which is a shame um but yeah no i mean obviously we've had tears we've had a little bit of encouragement might be needed maybe a few little extra breaks and a few little sit down talks and but that's what it's like when you're operating in that sort of area on the development graph in terms of comfort zone we're not, we're not just dabbling a little bit sometimes we're really pushing people r right to the edge and i know where the edge is and i know that if you go off the edge you've lost them the trust and everything and y you've totally destroyed what you're trying to achieve so um i don't know i just feel that i've got enough experience now where i can feel that i can push and push and push and push and i can read the warning signs that we, we're getting to the edge here like we're getting to the point where this is not enjoyable and there's not learning going on and this is just miserable now so if that ever happens then i can just pull it back in again a little bit but it's important that they are pushed not just a little bit a lot that's how you get the max development so how much would you say sort of percentage wise is kind of physical and how much is mental interesting question again it's all circumstantial if you ask me but depending on what you're doing I place a massive emphasis on mental, more than 90%, 95 maybe. Maybe higher, depending on what, what it is. Like, I don't think people realize, coming back to the monks, the power of the brain. I just, I think people massively underestimate the uh, potential of your own mental strength. And I've seen it time and time again, and there's countless examples all around the world of people that you might look at and think no way and they will destroy all of your um, preconceived ideas because they've got an insanely strong mind and like we were talking about earlier if you have the right motivation and the right why um, I almost think that human beings are pretty much unstoppable and that's why humans have achieved what they have certain humans and that's why we have progressed so far because if you get the right people with the right mentality and the right resources, off you go. Like I really don't think there's any any limits. So where do you get your mental resilience and inspiration from? Because you talked about, you know, when you were twelve, yeah. and you kind of wrote this list of what was it you said about l uh, uh, life? Yeah, the, the the list of everything that I enjoyed from life, everything that I wanted from life, and everything that I wanted from a job. Because that's quite wise at <laughs> 12 years old. Yeah. I mean, where, where did you get that but from? I but I didn't really know what else to do. Right? To me, it just seemed totally logical. I, it was like looking at this white wall now. I was just like, okay, I need to get the best job in the world for me. How am I going to do that? Because I have no idea what I want to do. And to me, it seemed logical to write all that stuff down to give me an idea of a bit more of like, who are you, Matt? And then... I just smashed this through those those old career selection computer things. Yeah. Loads of them. Every single school and university and anyone that had one of those things, I went and did it. Like I had loads of printouts and it was all saying outdoors or military. That's what all this stuff kept saying. I like think mine came back and uh, <laughs> I was supposed to be a gardener. Yeah, mine said I had, a, I, I had <laughs> landscape gardener a lot. It kept saying. Do you think that was the default for everything? Whatever <laughs> yeah. you input, you, you always just end up with an outdoor gardener. Yeah. So, <laughs> yeah, I, so I don't know. I mean, some people, I guess, have mentioned this wise wisdom before. And talking to Leah about it, who's, who's all spiritual, she's convinced that I've had like several lives and I'm several hundred years old mentally and blah, blah, blah. But... Um, I, d I honestly just saw that as, an, a, as a logical approach. And if I showed you that list, it would you'd laugh at it because it is so dreamy and so ridiculous. It's like, there's no job that is going to give you all this. But I don't really have that limitation. It's more, I understand that I'm not going to hit the perfect solution, maybe, but why not aspire for this crazy big idea? And there's a good chance you're going to get a large proportion of these things ticked off. 
than just saying, oh, I just want a job that pays me money and I get the weekends off and blah and blah. Do you know what I mean? Why? Like, I, I, my brain just it gets angry with that sort of attitude, to be honest. So I don't, I don't know where it comes from. It's, yeah, I, I think it's, I think it's like a drive to fulfil potential. Whatever I foresee as potential, it, it's like if you're going to do something, like my grandpa used to keep saying to me, and it's a famous quote, obviously, do it properly. If it's worth doing, do it properly. So that's how I see. And if it's not worth doing, then why are you doing it? So that that's the sort of attitude that I try and take with everything in life. Like, because I think one of the things with this podcast is to speak to kind of normal everyday people like you and me Mm -hmm. and make them realize that there is a lot of potential within every one of us massive massive you know it's like a it's like a general frustration map that i have even just walking the streets like even just walking around london even just sitting on the tube and looking at people (laughs) because well just londoners in general well just (laughs) everywhere i go in the world because you can tell a lot, A, 90% of them are looking at a bloody phone. So they're just turning into robots and just this whole sort of potential and self-realization is slowly going down the drain. And B, I feel like, I, I honestly feel like going up to every single one of them, picking them up and shaking them and saying, do you realize what you are capable of doing? I, I feel like doing that with everyone because it annoys me and it frustrates me that you have this really short life on this planet and you are capable of amazing, amazing things. Why aren't you doing these things? Or why aren't you at least trying to do these things? And um, there's there's another famous quote. I quite like quotes, like certain things stay with me. And there's this r- rapper called Prince EA and he talks about um, why most of us die at 25 years old. Interesting concept, right? And he's basically saying that by the time we hit 25, we're just dead inside and then we just mince on through life till 75 and then actually physically die. And then he also talks about where's the richest place in the world and people sort of think of a material thing or money or a country or something like that. And then he talks about it's the graveyard. Why is it the graveyard? Because you have all these, this unrealized potential and that really sticks with me. And so when I look at these people on the tube, and I've got this thing in my head. I'm just like, maybe this could be one of the best singers in the world. And maybe this guy could have the best business in the world. And maybe this girl could be the best sportsman. Do you know what I mean? It's like these insanely capable dreams. And you just know that none of this potential is being fulfilled. And it winds me up. <laughs> I don't know why. And how how do you weight those people up? And Adventure, Matthew. <laughs> <laughs> well, do you see... Yeah, how do you weigh those people up? And do you see that as part of your calling, I guess, to try and wake people up to their potential? Um, yeah. So, again, everyone's different. And I think people do get inspired. And I think they do do all this sort of self-awareness stuff and go to conferences and talks and blah, 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 blah. But a lot of it's quite short-term, quite short-term. And I went to one last year. And um, I I can mention their names. So Gary Vaynerchuk comes on stage. So he's this charismatic, very honest um, sales, like genius guy. And I think he puts off a lot of people because he speaks the truth and he's effing and blinding and he's very, very honest. And so all the other talkers there, they said, no one can film, no one can take photos, no one can do this because this is my most valuable information for my talk and I charge all this money and I don't want anyone copying it. And he absolutely destroyed them. And he said, I don't give a shit. He said, all of you can video all this. He said, in fact, I want you to video all this because you need to hear all this because a little bit of honesty goes a long way with people. And he said, do you know why? I'm, I'm quite happy to give you all my secrets and tell you how to be multimillionaires and do this and do this and do this because I know for a fact that less than 1% of you will do anything about it. You're just here to make yourself feel better, to get a short-term high and then you're going to go back to your home and you're going to drift back into your own life and then you'll be here next year. And this is how we make all this money. <laughs> and I sat there with a big smile on my face. I was <laughs> like, it's an interesting introduction, although 100% factually true. So going with that and the calling and all that sort of stuff, um, you can't do everything on this planet. And I've got all these 
ideas and fingers in pies and all that sort of stuff and you you sort of learn through marketing and things that you need to sort of come towards one purpose so i think i've decided that what i want to do is use adventure and experiences to have a positive impact on people's lives so that's my sort of broad vision and so everything that i try and do i put that through that filter and say are you doing that because if you're not don't do it like that's not towards this greater goal now whether or not we all have a calling or we have several callings or, or whatever that sits perfectly with me when I when I say it like all the bones in my body and everything it all is just like it's like you are very centered you're very focused and 100% happy about doing this you've tried it you're making a difference to people so this is no longer a dream now and whether you like it or not maybe you do have some sort of skill or ability in doing this so if you love it and it's effective why not keep doing it so yeah what's your bigger vision because <laughs> we've kind of talked about this but it'd be good how, to get how this long have you got on, Matthew? On, actually recorded look i'll just go basically straight to the top because there's lots of different ways to achieve this but ultimately i am so ambitious and big vision driven that most people think I'm a bit weird and it frustrates me because that's why I like it when I meet another person who has a similar sort of attitude because I'm like oh there are other people out there like this but it's very few and far between so ultimately I want to get to the point in life where I can bring together the world's best minds and achieve amazing things that drives humanity forward that is like a real passion of mine so people like elon musk and stuff like that i i, I admire in a lot of ways because um i think there's a lot of talkers out there and he is not a talker he's a doer and some would say like he works too hard he doesn't quite have the balance of work life but then at the same time if he didn't work as hard as he did he wouldn't have achieved what he has so each to their own on all that sort of front. But that yeah, that is ultimately what I want to do. And and everything that I do um, in my life is going towards that. Like I, w I want to be involved in this colonization of Mars and, uh, and solving massive problems for humanity. And the only way that you can do that is if you are in touch with the world's best minds and you have access to the resources and you know how to project manage efficiently and you know how to deliver on what you say you're going to deliver on and so everything i'm doing is trying to go towards that so what would your ultimate legacy want to be what would you be really happy with as a legacy i've never really thought of it but once you sort of um start watching how other people are working in life for example like you're starting to obviously realize legacy is becoming more and more important for you and i mentioned gary vaynerchuk as well like that's his whole focus like he's just like legacy 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 and he actually said that if you make that a priority um everything you do is much more hard hitting because it's long-term thinking it's not short-term decisions it's all towards this greater vision and, and i quite like that so what do i want to do i just I want to personally live as full a life as possible. Like think when I die, just think that was a bloody good effort. Genuinely. <laughs> bloody good effort. <laughs> yeah. That's sort of like <laughs> something you want on a tombstone or something. Just like <laughs> bloody <laughs> a bloody good effort. That'd be a great tombstone to have so, that, wouldn't it? <laughs> something like something like that, just like, yeah, you really had a good life, like you really gave it a good shot. And also I really want to start having a big impact if possible so using my skills and abilities and whatever to impact as many people in a genuine long-lasting positive way so i don't feel that i'm doing anything like as much as what i could be doing on that front um, and these things aren't always easy to achieve but i think i am starting to make small little steps towards it and i hope to and take on more and more bigger projects and start impacting more and more people. But I realize that as you scale, you've got to be very careful about diluting what you're doing. And so it's very, very important to me. I'd, I'd much rather help 
a thousand people properly than a million people a tiny tiny little bit because i think like we were talking earlier about that ripple effect if you genuinely impact people in a in a well very impactful way sort of thing that has a huge effect on them and then hopefully they will then have that sort of effect on other people whereas if you just scratch the surface a tiny tiny little bit you can and it can still do the ripple effect but uh, just my opinion is that again if you're going to do something do it properly so that's just so i haven't quite worked out how how that's all going to work but such is life i'm 32 i've got a bit of time <laughs> well, it's a great legacy to have yeah if i can achieve it so with so i run a kind of side project where we make good happen where the current i'm doing a little side well personal side project to achieve 403 good deeds but it's now turned into a, a bigger kind of collective movement thing where through we make good happen we're trying to achieve 12,000 good deeds yeah and we were talking earlier when before we were recording about that kind of ripple effect and people doing good deeds or just showing kindness and compassion towards you what's mm -hmm. the sort of is there kindness and well instance of kindness and compassion that people have shown you on your travels i mean there was one that you mentioned in iran yeah what's the sort of instance or acts of compassion and kindness that people have shown you on your travels do you know what it's actually the the smallest tiniest ones that i sort of remember the most because I sort of when it happens whatever it is even even if it's someone helping you out in like the tiniest way um for, for example e not even on my travels I've, I've had it before like on um on a bus you know sometimes if you get on a bus and it says like oh it's i don't know one pound 20 or something like that and just like oh sorry mate i've only got a tenner well we don't we don't do we don't do notes or something like that i was like well this is legal currency like no if you don't have the change you're not getting on and he's pressed the bus, he's pressed the button, he's basically like, get off. <laughs> yeah. And then someone behind, you just see this hand come over, and then like, there you go, there you go, mate, there's 120. And disbelief, I'm like, what? He goes, I'll, I'll pay for you. I said, I'm I, don't, I, don't, I said, I really don't have any change, I'm not, uh, where are you getting off, and things like that. He goes, just hand on your shoulder, and he's like, it's all right. He said, one day, you'll do something like this for someone else. And then he just, goes and sits back down and obviously I sit next to him and have a chat and stuff like that. And and stuff like that just really stays with me and it's the tiniest thing. It's not a load of money. It's very easy for anyone to do at any time. So I've paid for other people to get on buses now and I love it. It's weird. It's just, and they look at you as if you're mental. <laughs> They're just like, what, what do you want in return? And they look at you a bit shady and just like, what's this guy doing? What's his... They and think there is an alternative they, motive. They, they do, they? yeah. They, 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 they can't believe someone would do things like that. They cannot get their head around it, even though we're not talking about big money or whatever. Like, I did it in Hong Kong very recently, actually. This guy, uh, he'd, he just got off the aeroplane and he didn't have any Hong Kong currency. And he obviously hadn't thought about it and he's a little bit jet lagged. And, and he's like, oh, because he, I don't know why he tried to pay with a credit card. I was like, wait, it's a bus. <laughs> and um, I said, where are you going? I said, oh, I'll, I'll pay it. I'll pay for it. It's fine. And he goes, oh, you don't have to do that. I was like, well, wh what are you going to do? You're not going to walk, are you? And he goes, no. And I said, so you need to get on the bus? He said, yeah. I said, I'll pay for you. It's fine. I said, And then I said, I said, someone did this for me once. And they asked me to do it for someone else. And and so I said to you, you're my someone else. And you could tell even when he got off the bus, he was still like a bit blown by this whole thing, even though it's not the biggest gesture in the world by, by far. I think also nowadays, um, especially in the Western world, it's just so me, 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 selfish, 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 rush, 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 rush. No one gives a shit about anyone else. And so for actually a total stranger to help you in that way, I think that's why it is quite strange for people now. Whereas I think maybe back in the day or in a lot of other civilizations, they still have that brotherly, sisterly, family, community. And so it wouldn't be so shocking for that to happen. But I think definitely in, in the Western world, that is shocking. Because like you say, people are convinced, that they are convinced there's an ulterior motive. They they don't... Well, there's a camera recording 
Yeah, yeah, yeah. They're going <laughs> to jump out and be like, you took his money, you're yeah. a bad person or something <laughs> like that, yeah. I mean, I even kind of noticed it today because I used to live here in London for about five years <coughs> and people are very focused. It's quite a young city because people are just worried about their careers. They're rushing to get everywhere. Yeah. Um, and people... You know, I think some people, well, a lot of people just don't think they have got time to think about anything else because yeah. they're going to be late. You know, they're worried about their promotion. They're worried about yeah. their jobs and everything else. And if everyone else is acting like that, why be different yeah. and start and slowing down and being more present and thinking about other people? Yeah. Um, and even just driving up here, and I was driving through Shepherd's Bush where I used to live. I let a few people cross the road and a few people come out. And... The smiles on yeah. some of these people's face, they couldn't believe that I just kind of stopped and just sort of waved them across. Yeah. Because I don't think they're used to people doing that. It's just all small, tiny little things make such a large difference. And and so I've been shown this, not just here, but all around the world. And each time it happens, it blows you away. And like you say, the Western world is going downhill in this respect big time. But a lot of the rest of the world is still like this. It's still community driven. It's still we all band together and help each other. And especially in, in Indo. And it's so nice, like so nice to be part of that. You feel part of a family. You feel that you're all part of this joint effort moving forward. And so coming back to the Western world thing, I think it's more like uh, people are just go, 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 busy, busy, busy. And it's like cool to be busy. And if you're not busy, then you can't have a good life sort of thing because you must not be going anywhere, which actually is utter crap. And actually what people don't realize is that to have time, coming back to my monk idea, to have time is bliss because you need to stop. You need to let everything filter. You need to let everything stop and settle and think, right where are we and i think it's actually a really sad reflection on yourself if you can't do that and i think it, that's another thing that adventure shows it gives people thinking time it, you are not rushed you don't have these priorities you don't have to do all this stuff all the time and be busy 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 you can just stop and just watch the world go by and it's such a beautiful thing to do basically and and, and it's important core human thing to do which i think we're forgetting more and more and more it's sad it's really yeah so do you think success is quite closely tied in with community and working with others and helping others i think it all comes down to your own definition of success my definition of success like i said to you earlier is happiness so do i think working with others gives me happiness yeah i mean ultimately it I think it depends what you're trying to achieve. But I think as with anything, and I've learned this and I'm sure everyone else has and we all know that as a group of people, you're far more likely to achieve an aim because you're utilizing resources effectively than just one person, one mind, one thing, just trying to do everything on their own. Like it's, it, You're just never going to achieve the same. Um, you, you're never going to achieve the same results because it's all down to resources at the end of the day. It, it's all down to project management and resources and realizing strengths and weaknesses. So if you can tap into multiple strengths rather than just one person's strengths, what a surprise that is going to be more effective. So then it all comes down to leadership and, and yeah, making, making whatever you want to happen actually happen. Do you ever get scared? Do you ever feel the fear? <laughs> you know, I went, um, <laughs> I'm not sure if he'll, in, he'll, uh, be happy that I mentioned his name but anyway I went with a I went for a meal with a guy who's extremely high up in a very big global brand recently and he asked me some of these questions he's like do you ever get scared um do you ever worry just these really it was really weird he was like hi I'm whatever we sat down we started to eat and then he just went bang 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 and I was just like this is a bit strange and what I realized it's because he does and he'd realized very, very quickly that I don't. And he was trying to work out why not. So, no. I, I mean... So what, no to being in, scared, no to fear? In in general, no. Obviously, we're all scared and have fear at some point in some situations. But I'd say, personally, for me, um, 
there's very 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 little that i'm scared of or or have fear and i think that that's all down to the amount of experiences that i've had and put myself through which means i know myself very very well and i have enough mental references from all this stuff that i think as long as whatever i'm about to do isn't as bad as that and you can deal with that you've done this before why why would i be scared and even if it is going to be worse than something i've done before you realize it wasn't ever as bad as you think it is you've just created all this apprehension in your head and the actual thing that you're being asked to do it's just it's just all in your head that you're creating this and i see that a lot on in indo with adventures like i see people creating so much fear and everything especially with the motorbikes and stuff in fact there's this one girl i won't mention her name but um janet <laughs> <laughs> let's call her janet for example <laughs> she won't mind me saying this but so we're sat on these motorbikes now obviously i've got a lot of experience on motorbikes and she didn't have much experience but she'd done the professional training and we're literally sat next to each other stood on the bikes with our feet on the ground she's shaking we haven't the bike's not even on yet mm. and i just calmly said to her i said why are you shaking oh i'm really not sure about this blah 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 blah. i said just just pause for a second just just look at me what am i doing and you were naked <laughs> yeah <laughs> <laughs> and there was dwarves and monkeys and just weird <laughs> stuff good though so i said what am i doing i said i'm just stood on a bike that's engines off am i shaking what are you doing? Stood on the bike, engines off. So we're doing exactly the same. Yeah. So everything that you're creating now in your head is you. So let's turn the engine on. Mine goes on. Hers goes on. Still, we're doing exactly the same. And so I, I see it in other people. And, and I think that helps me as well. Because I'm starting to realize... A, noticing all these things in other people and B, how to solve them. So if I ever feel myself going that direction, I'm like, you know how to solve this. So bloody solve it now. And I think maybe, I'm sure there's a lot of science behind all this. I'm like a Neanderthal trying to explain it. But yeah, so I, ultimately, Matt, it's all down to experiences and mental references. And I think the more experiences and the more mental references you have in a, in a wide array of activities, then why should you be scared of anything? Because you've pretty much been there, done that. Simple so you, as that. So you kind of had fear at some point. Of course. But because of, of course. the experiences, yeah. that fear has become less and less. Yeah. And you use that then to because kind of it's dampen it, is it, when you feel... Because I, I take it you still feel the kind of physical yeah. thing of fear. Yeah. yeah. But you know how to kind of like push it down. I know how to control it. Um, and also, if it's something that I'm being stupid about or no I'm being stupid about. I just apply total logic to it. Or why are you this? Why are you that? You've done this. You've been here before and you're still alive. So draw on that reference. Draw on that experience. Do whatever you did then. Take those lessons and apply it right now. Done. Why I'm, do you think I'm very hard on myself in that respect. <laughs> but it, it works for me. Yeah. Everyone's a bit different. But again, it all comes down to being honest with yourself and self-control and knowing yourself well. What would you kind of say to those? I think it's the vast majority of people that <coughs> stay in their comfort zone, whatever they do. Mm -hmm. What would you say or how would you get them out of that comfort zone? How do you wake up those people that are comfortable but may think they're happy? Or they might be scared of going over that comfort zone or do we need or do we need a, or do we as a human race need people to be comfortable because otherwise everyone would be doing wild stuff i mean okay so two two questions there so um the first one is how do you get people out of their comfort zone sort of thing and i think the way that you do that is getting people to pursue their curiosity I refuse to believe that people aren't curious. I think we're all curious. I think it's an innate human thing. So rather than just being curious, why not follow that curiosity? Why not? If you're thinking, oh, I wonder what it's like to go this way to work, or, or I wonder what it's like to do this, or Dave's just done this sort of race. I wonder what it was like. Well, ask Dave and say, look, mate, you've just done this. 
I'm wondering about it. Can you help me out? And I'm sure Dave will be like, yeah, I'll help you, mate. And then what a surprise. It's a nice introduction. It's not scary. It's a gentle way of testing the water. And I think that that's healthy. And I think that the more that the people test the water, the more that they realize this is all fear in my own head. It's not actually as bad as you think it's going to be. Let's do something else. Let's do something else. And then you're just building all this. It's all self-confidence. You're building all this self-confidence. You're building all these mental references. And then you start to see all this development happen. And then you look back at where you were and you're just like, I'm going places. I'm I'm really learning now. And I love this. It's like, it's, it's like a drug. Or for me, it's like a drug. And I think it's important to stay happy and stay fresh and keep challenged and and keep alert and keep keep going forward like I, I don't understand it's like stagnant water why is stagnant water bad for you that's what a lot of people are like they're like stagnant water and it's again it comes back to this sort of it's, it's a bit sad anyway and to answer your second one yes to have any sort of functioning society of course there's different types of people and, and that's required but I think the government and the powers that be would love to and try to train us all to be um, rule abiding robots that just function in their perfect little pretty system and just say yes and don't cause any trouble and don't have your own thinking and don't question things and just sit in your rut for however many years, do your nine to five, retire at 65, draw your pension, which is probably not going to be there in 10, 20 years anyway, and then die. And that is what the powers that be want because it's easy to control. Now, imagine if you've got all these people challenging misconceptions, challenging the curiosity, like starting all these businesses and really like disrupting things. And yeah, there might be a bit of chaos, but from chaos comes order. And, and, and I think that it's healthy. And I think you'd see people feel more alive because they're challenging, they're going for things, they're interacting with other people, they're seeing possibilities and breaking through barriers. And there's that desire to live again. And so it's so Im it's so important, Matt, and that's why it makes me sad that enough or the vast majority don't. So there's my friend Emma Serrano, who's got cerebral palsy. Yeah. And I saw the result of her seizing an opportunity where she she's basically been in a wheelchair for the majority of her life had started to try to learn how to walk when she was very young. I think it was like. And she's like six or, you know, kind of a young child. <coughs> and I've witnessed her in the last year. She's decided, well, she basically decided at one point, she sat in a wheelchair and basically decided, I need to start using my legs again. This is, I'm wasting my potential. Mm -hmm. So with a physiotherapist that she's been working with, Peter Spire Fitness, she's, over the course of the, the year, she's pushed herself to... From the chair, the walking chair, to a kind of <coughs> um, like a stroller with wheels to using her walking sticks. And mm -hmm. this is kind of an amazing transformation that she's gone through and I've kind of witnessed and been filming parts of it. And she did the Cardiff Half Marathon back in October where she actually managed to walk two miles of wow. the half marathon when the furthest she had ever walked was wow. a mile. And... <coughs> As a filmmaker, this week I actually witnessed her walking completely unaided. Wow. Uh, well, it was the second time she'd she'd walked the first time the day before, and I thought, right, I've got to come out and yeah, film this. Yeah. And um, it was amazing to see. And I was actually welling up behind the viewfinder to actually see this girl, this woman who I had first met in a wheelchair. And apparently, when she kind of first came to the gym. She could hardly kind of move out of the chair. Right. To actually seeing her walking without sticks, taking yeah. one step. Something that we take for granted. For, for complete yeah. granted, yeah. yeah. And that was an amazing transformation. But it just took that one decision with her. Mental. Yeah. To say, enough's enough. I want to change this and I'm going to do something about it and took action. Mm -hmm. It's 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 the perfect demonstration of the power of a combination of mental strength and a dream it's as simple as that it's it's an, and it's incredible to watch um in in those sorts of cases for example like it's all very well seeing certain people achieve certain things but some are definitely more 
um, impressive to humans and others. And I think something like that is to, to witness, like you say, especially as you've witnessed the journey. And as with any of these things, there's a lot of ups and downs. There's a lot of emotion. There's a lot of struggle. And there's a lot of people that give up. They might start, but they'll give up. So to see the perseverance and, and people really push through, of course you naturally well up because it's almost indescribable. That's why emotion happens sort of thing because you're just like, I, ca I can't even put this into words. So my body's doing it for me sort of thing. What would you say to people that might be listening and just thinking, well... Our two listeners. <laughs> <laughs> Hello, Albie yeah. and Andrea. <laughs> What would you say to people that might be listening and go, well, I've got a, a nine to five, I'm happy, but I can listen to what you're saying and I think there may be more potential in me, mm -hmm. but I'm scared. I don't know what to do. What's my next step? I'm s I'm in, I've got my mortgage, um, yeah. you know, I've got my mortgage, I've got my salary coming in every month. Yeah. I know, you know, I'm in a full-time contract. Yeah. Why should I do anything differently or what, what could I do to potentially dig into my potential? New experiences. Um, I'm so sold on new experiences and I'm not saying international adventures and blah, blah, blah. I'm, I'm purely saying that you have the same core set of friends, you do the same job, you probably drive on the same roads and the same route and the same shops. Everything's the same. You're just repeating the same and same and same. You're stagnant water. So... Do what I said like with Dave and things like that. When your friends suggest, would you like to do this? And you normally be like, nah. Yes. Yeah, I would. Let's go and give it a go. And yes, some stuff you're not going to enjoy. But you never know. You might actually find some stuff that you absolutely love. And you have no idea because you've never tried it. And that goes for new friends as well and new people. Just be more willing to go for it. And everybody has opportunities. But most people say no because of this fear. Just say yes. And I'm not, uh, I've just written this Red Bull article about regrets and things like that. And I'm not saying I'm one of these people that's like, you need to say yes to everything because it's just not realistic and ra not practical. But we all have things that come across our, our paths in life, which it's easier to say no. But if there's not a genuine reason to say no, then why not give it a go? Just like I say, experiences that are massive for humans this is how we learn this is how we develop and you have to experience it you can't do it remotely like you must live that experience and i just think with anything with sport and people and business and travel or um hobbies literally anything just anything different to your core life will start helping with all that because then one thing leads to another, then you meet this person and then you get introduced to that and then you have to start doing that. And then before you know it, as you start bouncing off the walls, as I call it, and doing more and more experiences, you start going in a certain direction, whether you like it or not. And that direction is your passion. And a lot of people don't know that. But the only way you're going to get there is by keep bouncing off the walls. You can't just do one thing and then try it and be like, oh no, I told you, I told you if I did this, it'd be crap. And then just give up because I think that's what people do as well. You have to like give it a chance and maybe do 10 things, 20 things, 30 things. And once you do n multiple numbers, you will start getting lucky with one or two of them. And then you start thinking, mm, maybe this is an interesting area that I should keep going down, see what happens. Um, so again, it's all attitude and curiosity. How do you turn it around when you get those kind of knockbacks and rejections and you think, oh, I've tried something, it's not working for me? Um, two things so A I like using negative experiences as motivations so I like turning them on, on their head and I think it builds resilience and I think you know what we were talking about achievements before I think it's actually good to have more pitfalls and it be a bit of a struggle on the way because when you actually achieve whatever you're trying to do I think it feels way more th the feeling is amazing rather than if you just doof, had a go at that I was amazing it's like okay, you can see the sort of flat tone of my voice, and then what was what was the sec what was the second part of it? I've no idea. <laughs> <laughs> um, well, I suppose it's how it was when you get that rejection. How do you kind of come back? How do you? What do you tell yourself to to come back from those kind of rejections or those kind of knockbacks and give things another go or that resilience? 
Um, so I did a talk recently, and you can Google this image, and it's burnt very, very clearly on my head. So everyone has a plan, let's say wh whatever, in wh whatever field, to go from here to here, yeah? And everyone looks at it in an idealistic way of, this is just a perfectly straight line, I'll just do that and it'll be done. There's another one, and the line goes, and there's sort of like shark infested custard, and then the line goes this way, and then it goes this way, and then there's the sea, it's, and it's basically saying that that's reality. Mm. And with what, whatever any of us try and achieve, that that is reality. So in my head, whenever I come up with an idea and I begin, I know that I'm going to fall in the shark infested custard, that the hill's going to be twice as high as I thought it would be. I'm going to end up drowning in the sea for a little bit, but I'll recover. I know that's going to happen. And so I've mentally prepared myself for that happening. So the minute I hit my first hurdle or pitfall or whatever, I'm just like, it's all right, Matt, you're in this little bitch. You'll get out of it and you'll come up here. And you're going to have another one soon, so don't get too worried about it. It's all part of the process. And so I think I've built that mental expectation into my head so that when it happens, it's just like a go with the flow mentality. It's like, this is supposed to happen. This is normal. I don't look at it and think, oh, fuck, like the world's ended. Because, yeah, it's life. Don't fight it. Just try and embrace it a little bit more and try and enjoy it. It's it's that sort of go with the flow. And you're always learning. That's the other that's the other thing. It's like, okay, you might have got rejected or you might have f uh, failed at something or whatever, but I guarantee you would have learned stuff doing it because you're doing something different. And and so I like to turn all ne negatives into a positive. It's like, all right, that didn't quite work out, but what did you learn from that? And what can you use now to re-attack and have another go at it? I can learn this or don't do that next time because <laughs> that's what cocked the whole thing up. So I think as long as you just see it as this larger learning process and smile about the whole thing, um, yeah, that's that's how I do it anyway. So people might be listening to you thinking, and just thinking... This guy's <laughs> nuts. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> pretty normal. But, they, you know, you've got a Guinness World Record. You know, you've flown fighter jet planes you've conquered big mountains and volcanoes and you've done all these crazy and cool things what w some people might just go this is just totally out of mm -hmm. you know my reach what would you say to that is what i'd say is there a clean word that you could say to that <laughs> uh. i'll just beep it it's fine Utter rubbish <laughs> is a clean way of saying it. But but I say bollocks because I mean it. And, and, and it's a real strong feeling of mine because it's, what, it's another thing that angers me in life is people's convenient excuses. I feel whatever excuse you give me, I will find a solution to it. I will. And then when you give that solution to someone, they don't like that because now you're making them face reality and they don't like the fact that you're exposing them basically you're you basically saying that's that's a load of crap yeah why don't you do this now 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 what are you going to say and then they'll come back and they're like okay and then you'll basically get to the point where you're saying there is no reason why you cannot do this and i so strongly believe in this because if for example i came from an extremely wealthy family and i was given 10 million us dollars or something and then i did all this stuff I totally get why people would then say, this is out of my reach. And, and, and this happens all over the, the world and people stand on stage preaching about all this thing and they haven't told the absolute truth about maybe a massive helping hand that they had that other people don't have. And it really, really annoys me. But there are normal people out there with normal jobs and normal lives and normal opportunities that do go on to do some interesting things. And that's sort of how I class myself. And that's why I get so annoyed about it because I feel like you come to me with your problem and I will find a way that you can do it and the, that you are able to do it. And if you now turn this down, that's yourself. That's that You can't blame the, the situation anymore, which you love to because it's the easy way out and all your friends are going to confirm it. But if I say, why don't you go and do that? It's going to be hard, it's, and, and this is the other thing. Generally, the solution you pre present to them is not easy. People want the easy, the shortcut, the fast track. It's like, 
th- that isn't life either. Like you have to understand that to get to places is hard work and people are shy of hard work. Again, that's just a reality in it because the phrase, you're so lucky, honestly, I want to smash people in the face when they say that to me. <laughs> I, I have that much anger for that phrase because... Even if you were a monk? <laughs> well, maybe I would have had my inner peace by then and maybe I will say... The only lucky thing that I'm happy with, that, that I'm lucky about is having medically the body to be able to have a pilot medical. That's it. That is that is it. And like Emma or, or whatever, I, I realize I'm lucky to have a able body. Okay. That is literally it. Apart from that, I went to uh, normal comprehensive schools and had a normal upbringing and n- no like silver spooning or... Or, or whatever, and that therefore, A, that's why I know how to solve these problems, because I've been in those situations, and B, there's just, there is no excuse. It's just hard work, and it's just people quite happy to talk about how bad their situation is and how lucky all these other people are, and and then, and then that's it. They'll just let it die. And the other thing to realize is there are lucky people out there. So don't just cry about it. It's just part of life. Like, we all get dealt a certain hand. None of us choose what family we're born into or what situation we're born into. And yes, the, it's it's, lo- it's the lottery of life, isn't it? Some people have a really, I'll use my language, bad deal. And other people have an absolutely very, very fortunate deal. But at that same time, it's not their fault. They didn't choose that to happen to them. It, it's just happened. So I see it as like a, like a, I see life as a game of poker. You dealt the cards you dealt. You then have to learn how to play them. That's that's how I see it. So what's next for Matt Pryor? I'm just going to keep things going, basically, Matt. I've got a big whiteboard at home where I've written up my grand master plan. And at the moment, there's sort of several pillars and flying adventure academy. I've started up a whole corporate side of things, which is using experiences and uh, being in the outdoors and nature to sort of positively impact people and team leadership and personal development and mil- military scenarios. Uh, that's all kicking off in all in Asia right now. Um, and then probably try and get one more big adventure in, which unfortunately I can't disclose yet um, before I'm a dad because it's very important to me um, that I'm a good dad and that I spend time with my kids and my family. And then the rest is just fingers in pies seeing where little things go but ultimately I've learned a when to say no and that it's important to say no and b I'm very clear on what I want to do with the next sort of 30 40 years of my life and I've structured it all and it all makes sense and it all connects and that's the direction it's just now making it happen really and some people struggle with that because they're like oh yeah but you need the next and the next and the next it's just like well, I don't actually, I've got what I need to do. It's just now making this plan a reality. But as always, I'm very open to new ideas and things and that always happens. New projects crop up and you meet new people and you go in new directions. And so I'm not sort of 100% rigid and would say no to everything else from now on. But um, I am getting to the point where I'm busy, very busy even though we were talking about the Western world and things like that. I do obviously ha- prioritise time off. But um, yeah, I think you just got to be careful not to take on too much because otherwise you start diluting everything and then sort of you're not doing anything properly. So for this last question then, mm-hmm. imagine you've paid for a plane and there's this... <laughs> what type of plane? Oh no, I'm asking it airline pilot a kind of a small plane that's carrying a, a banner behind it yeah and all your friends and family and loved ones are in a field uh, a festival yeah and you've hired this plane to fly past yeah. with a banner behind it what would your message be to all of those people and loved ones and your friends your message maybe you you have died or but there's a message that you want to get across to everyone else, maybe after you've gone. Uh, I really like the quote. It's £10 per letter. <laughs> and I'm joking. You, <laughs> can, you can have as many letters as you want. Okay. I really like the quote. Um, 
commit to something, put your balls on the line, then figure it out. I, I, I use that massively for absolutely everything in life. And then just tagging on to that. And then whatever you do do, try and work out how you can positively impact other people on the way. And that, I think, is... I mean, there's lots of other one-liners and things that have had a, a big impact on my life. And, and I do think that it's important. Can't stick it out of the back of a plane, can I? <laughs> <laughs> you might, we, we'll, we'll have two planes for you. <laughs> well, I think we'll need a whole bloody Air Force. <laughs> Uh, yeah, no, ultimately, commit to something, put your balls on the line, then figure it out. And then plane number two yeah. can say, positively impact as many people as possible the best you can. That's lovely. I'd like to see those messages on a plane. That'd be cool. Yeah, it's hard, it's hard to do that. I'm sure if we thought about, if I sort of thought about things a bit more. But again, sometimes it's good being put on the spot because they're the things that come to come to mind. Well, thank you very much, Matt Pryor. All the way from Hong Kong here in London in this fabulous studio. <laughs> <laughs> I like the way you call it a studio. <laughs> very dubious hotel room. <laughs> Thank you very much, Matt Pryor. This has been the We Make Success Happen podcast. Cheers. See you next time. Cheers, Matt. It's a good chat. And then we've got a little jingle that plays. Up.